Okay, almost. All right. All right, Lacey. Thanks for joining us Thank on you. Survivor. Yeah, um, um, so as you know, Survivors is a group of people who feel really strongly about service. We love it. And we love helping those who have lost their loved ones through service. Um, we asked you actually here today to talk to us on the second week of the month, on the second Sunday, we do a Survivors Inspires and you have an inspiring story. Uh, just to introduce you a little bit to everyone who is just now joining us, I guess just now. Uh, Lacey Nymeyer John is a Olympian. She is a 10 time NCAA champion. She's a 2007 world championship double medalist. She's a 2008 Olympic silver medalist and the 2009 NCAA woman of the year, which is like, wow, that is quite a story. Um, you grew up here in Tucson, which is awesome. That's where I'm from. Uh, and you swam at the University of Arizona. Bear down. Okay. Right? Go cats. Yeah. Um, and then after that, you found opportunities to serve, right? You worked in various um, places within the university, uh, teaching and helping with personal development. Um, at first to athletes, but then to other people who were serving other places. So um, we're so glad you could be here and we wonder if you'd answer some questions for us. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions. All right, so what drew you in about swimming? What made you wanna be a swimmer? Oh, uh, well, you know, it's funny that you say that because I come from a family that is very athletic. Right. So my grandpa is in the Hall of Fame here at the University of Arizona for basketball. He played golf. He was just an all around fantastic athlete. My dad played multiple sports. He was a football coach um, and you know, many other family members played volleyball, basketball, you know, the real sports. And I fell in love with swimming, <laughs> which I still had to convince my family that it's not just something you do at birthday parties, like it's an actual sport, it's a real thing. And, um, but for me, I one love the water. Growing up in Tucson, like you, Mikhail, it's hot and I don't like to sweat, so. <laughs> it is, it's necessary, right, to swim, I, it is necessary. Yes, and my grandma had a pool growing up and I was just in it. Like, I don't ever remember not swimming. It was just something that I loved and wanted to be in the water all the time. And when I started just summer league swimming, it was, it was, it was amazing to me. And I loved the moment where you would stand up on the blocks where it's like, okay, you can't go back and you're just waiting for the gun or the beep to go off and you just dive into the water. And that for me was the hook. And I loved it. I loved everything about it. And so maybe I'm a little bit of a control freak because I love the individuality of swimming as well. <laughs> you know, it, it was it was on me. And I had that responsibility to train, to perform, to you know, handle what was gonna happen between the walls, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, that was that's really where where the story began was just loving the water and loving the ability to compete. And I'm not necessarily a competitive person. Like I'm fine, not, not winning a board game, <laughs> but I love the challenge of it. And swimming is one of those sports where you will never have the perfect race. So you're constantly trying to progress and get yourself to you know, that next level, which might be hundreds of a second, right? And, and there's just that constant progression that just keeps you coming back every day. Oh, that's amazing. It's interesting to hear that you're not very competitive. You would think that that would be, but I guess in swimming, you're really doing a lot of racing the clock, right? 
that's really just you and the clock. Cool. Um, so where is your medal? What do you do with it once you get it? Like your Olympic medal? I mean, I yeah, I can't believe you've ever taken it off, right? <laughs> Well, there is a funny story. So when I came back from Beijing in 2008, I was living with my parents because I had moved out of my apartment with my roommates to focus. And I couldn't find my medal for a long time. And it was because my dad was wearing it underneath his shirt. <laughs> and oh was, my gosh. And he'd be like, oh, you want to see this? <laughs> I pull it out. And um so it's definitely a shared treasure in our family, but um, for the most part, it's just kind of in my house and I love showing it to people and, and, you know, I would do swim clinics all the time and kids would want to wear it. And then they would say, oh, well, do you want to see my medal? And I'm like, yes, you show me that eight and under medal. I want to see it, <laughs> it but it's, it's cool. It's, it's something tangible that people can take away. And for me, it's, it's, a lot of good memories wrapped up into one little object. One little thing. God, that's so neat. That's amazing. Okay. Um, so in 2008, when you got that medal, you did the four by four, 100 meter relay, which I don't know, maybe you can explain it, but it's a very fast race and it's like the fastest stroke and it's so fast. What are, what is the preparation for an event like that? I mean, how the mental, the physical, what went into pre preparing for it? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of my um, Olympic and international experience on the, on the USA national team was doing relays. And that was primary, my primary role on the team was to be a relay swimmer. And I actually loved doing relays. I, I felt like in that moment, you're not swimming for yourself, right? You're swimming for other people. And so I can remember you know, that race in particular, because in 2008, in that particular, particular relay, it's the first day of the entire you know, Olympic swimming. So we were one of the first events and you know, there's a lot of energy and I remember being in the ready room, which is a little space that you have to kind of cram all the swimmers in before, you know, they parade out behind the blocks and you see people wave, right? And you got to put on mm -hmm. the face. And in that ready room, I was the youngest, like, person on the team. I was the only rookie <laughs> with the other wow. US. And that was actually the race where I swam with Dara Torres. You know, many people know her story is you know, the 40 year old, her fifth Olympics. We also had Natalie Coughlin, who was the most decorated female swimmer of all time. And then there was Carolyn Joyce who had been at a previous Olympics. And then there was Lacey. <laughs> and so my role was really just not to screw up. So don't get DQ'd and don't be the weakest leg. <laughs> right, right. And that was my goal. And, um, you know, I, I was nervous, I was, and trying to keep my thoughts positive and focused on where I needed to go. And mentally, that was, that's the hardest part of any event like that is to be able to handle your emotions and to keep your thoughts in check because you train for years, right? For, for the Olympics, it only comes around every four years. So, you know, the, the preparation that goes into that moment you, know, you you train every single day, all the little things, your your breath pattern, your split pace, your finishes, your takeoffs, all of those are fine-tuned. So at this moment, I should not be thinking about them. They should be automatic. And I definitely was leaning on those many, many moments of preparation so that all I had to do was to manage my emotions and just do what I had trained to do. And when you're in an event, especially in a relay. I was the second leg. So I remember standing behind the blocks, you hold hands with your team, they announce the Team USA, you raise your hands, everyone's happy, and then it's down to business. The gun goes off and you're, you see your teammates dive into the water and you see the other teammates and everyone's yelling and there's a lot of energy going on. And it's one of the most exciting experiences when it's your turn. So then you stand on the blocks and you're watching your teammate come in 
and you know that your teammate has just given everything and they're just trying to finish the race. And when you watch that, it's really hard to not feel like, all right, she is giving it everything she can. There is no way that I am going to leave anything on the table. And you just know that it's not just for you, but it's for those other teammates that are standing there with you. And oftentimes in swimming, your relay races are much faster than your individual races. And so I think it's absolutely attributed to the external perspective that you put on your race, right? You're doing it for someone else. You're doing it as a team rather than just for yourself. And it elevates your performance. So it was a great race. Uh, it was a tight race. I remember watching Dara Torres, you know, she had an amazing last leg. She touched the wall. We were two tenths behind the Netherlands who won the gold medal, set the world record. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were right in the mix there and, and it was a great performance out of everyone. And you know, it was such an amazing experience then to stand on the podium and do the media um, uh, appearances afterwards, just talking about that moment. So it was really exciting. Oh, that is amazing. And that's amazing your takeaway from that, that in that what helped you to do better in that moment was taking the time to focus on other people, even in an individual sport where, the the discipline that you had needed in all your training was just up to you right but that that you found sort of the push in focusing on others that's so neat yeah that was really neat so what is the weirdest or most surprising thing about the olympics like that those of us who may never be i mean i don't want to close the door but i will probably never be an olympian <laughs> so what are the things that that we should know or that surprised you yeah so the best part about the Olympics, besides all the free stuff and free food, it's super cool. Um, I tell, I tease people all the time. I'm like, I'm still set for 4th of July because I have so much USA stuff. It's not even funny. And my family has a ton of USA stuff. But besides that, you go to the Olympic Village and here you are with all the athletes from around the world and every body shape, size, you know, is, is represented. The diversity within the Olympics and you're walking around with the best in the world, but no one looks the same, right? I mean, you can be tall, you can be short, you can be thick, you can be thin. I mean, and it doesn't matter. And when you, cause you're one of the best at what you do. And I think that was refreshing to me of just being able to say, wow, look, Look at people who took the tools that they were given and they made this amazing, you know, career for themselves and everyone had a space to contribute and you were all there to really celebrate human competition and the performance of the human body and what it can do. And, and that was just really cool to be a part of and, and great to see on such a big scale. That is that is nice to know. I guess we don't really think about that. We think of the athletes being just like looking the same and being the same, but that really everyone found their way to excel, right? Oh, that's so neat. Yeah. All right. So I would imagine you didn't get to where you were without having some ups and downs. Did you ever have times where you had injuries or issues or times that you didn't think you were gonna make it? Um, and how did you get through those? um every single day <laughs> and, and it started young like I remember very young right before I could even drive when I would come back from practices and I would just be like devastated you know either I I didn't make my splits or practice was just I felt like crud you know whatever it was and and I would always come back to my family you know around the dinner table and we ask each other how each other's day went and I'd be like it was horrible <laughs> and of course I had a dad who was a football coach so there was no like sympathy at our table which was great because it was like okay well you had a bad day so let's figure this out and um and I was grateful for that and so in my youth I kind of just had to figure it out and knowing that I wasn't going to quit good days and bad days, I understood the waves of the sport. 
But there was one time when I was in college that really was like the moment where you where you get it. Like maybe my brain was just a little bit more you know mature at that time where it just clicked at a different level. And I, I remember the practice. We, it was awful. It was such a hard workout. And I remember crying, like you're, you're have your goggles on and it's just filling with water from tears because <laughs> it just hurts and you're, you're frustrated. And it was just one of those days. And I was like, you know what? I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I have, I'm on the University of Arizona swim team, which is one of the best swim teams in the world. Like not just you, USA swimmers, like internationally, one of the most competitive teams in the world at that time. And they are just crushing it and I am not keeping up. And so I literally took my cap and goggles off. I threw them on the pool deck. I got out of the pool and I told Frank, my coach, and I said, I'm done. Like, I don't belong here. I'm out, see ya. <laughs> and he's like, oh no, 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 no. You're not leaving today. Get back in the water. I don't care what happens. You're gonna finish the set and I'll see you after practice. And I was like, oh this is not good. <laughs> this is not a good decision on my end. So, you know, I make it through the practice. You know, I'm just cleaning out my goggles every time I get to the wall because it's just, I'm just crying the whole time. And I go to the locker room, I get cleaned up, I make it back to his office and he's sitting at his desk and he has a stopwatch on the desk. And I'm like, man, this is, this is going to be rough. Like, I'm just ready for him just to lean into me. Right. And he sits down and he gets out the stopwatch and he's like, Lace, what if I could tell you and promise you that you would drop three tenths of a second this year in your hunter free? And I was like, are you, are you serious? Thank you so much. Like that would be great. <laughs> and, um, he was like, well, well, okay, hold on. And he shows me on the stopwatch, start, stop, how long it takes to do three tenths of a second, which was just literally start, stop. And he showed me on the watch three tenths of a second. And then I was like, okay, like I can do it. Like, that's not a lot of time. How do I do it? But in swimming, that's like, that's, that's a ton of time. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to get some like inspirational pieces here. And he's like, oh no, no, hold on. What would it be like if you added three tenths of a second this year in your hunter free? And again, you know, we do the start stop and we like put into real time, like what three tenths of a second actually means. And I was like, coach, that would be awful. Like, why are we even talking about this? Right. Positive visualization. And he was like, do you understand what you're, what you're talking about right now? Three tenths of a second which is start, stop. If it's on this side of the fence, everything's great. Everything's happy, you're perfect, we have the greatest season ever, right? Three tenths of a second on this side of the fence, you're devastated, you should quit, right? It's a whole waste. And at that moment, I realized that that is madness, right? <laughs> I mean, how can we just hinge our happiness and our misery on such a small increment? that is sometimes uncontrollable, right? You never know what's gonna happen. You're a human, right? It could be just a bad day or a bad flip turn or a bad touch. You have no idea. And so for me, starting to recognize that success cannot always be measured in time. It can't always be measured in medals, right? Success is really something that is a journey and it's growth. And so when I look at those moments where I wanted to quit where it was too hard when, you know, I'd be injured with my back or my shoulder or whatever it was, you know, I, I needed to learn to enjoy those moments and to take them in for what they are and to understand that that's part of the process. And I need to learn how to define success for myself rather than really, um, hinging it on three tenths of a second somewhere in my race. And, and I think when I apply that to my life, and I think when we look at our lives, you know, where are those moments where we put so much pressure on ourselves to perform in a certain way that we forget like the whole journey and, and really the meat and the purpose 
of this whole experience, but we only focus on this little piece of it. And so when we were able to put it into perspective, and again, really truly understand the ebbs and flows of the waves of life, you know, as long as we're kind of moving in an upward trajectory, we're doing all right. And, and knowing that success is not a straight linear path, um, you know, we, we can start seeing that for ourselves, so. Thank you, that's amazing. And I think that's important even, you know, a lot of the members of our group are in different places on their grief journey too, right? Like for some, it's very fresh, for some they're further along. And I think to just remember that there are ebbs and flows, right? There are times when we feel like we're good and we can move forward and we feel strong. And there are times when we don't feel strong, when we, uh, you know, and to not get too down on ourselves and not get too worried that it's never going to get better. And it's never going to, you know, uh, we're never going to, you know, um, be okay again. And we're never going to do those things, but just that there's ebbs and flows, right? That's awesome. Thank you. Just to kind of build off what you were saying, you know, part of this conversation with my coach, you know, he, he was like, Lace, your season, you know, is made up of days, right? Those days are the things that you can't control. And you're going to have good days and bad days. And you put a couple of good days together, you're going to have a good week. You put a couple of good weeks together, you're going to get a good month. You put a couple of good months together, you're going to have a great season. And that, I mean, just to your point of just like understanding that not every day is going to be great, but if you can have more good days than bad days, then you're probably moving in the right direction. And if, when you have a good day, put it, put it in the bank, right? And accumulate those good days because good days turn into good weeks, months, and years. Awesome, thank you. Um, so in the moments when you felt your resilience slipping, did you have any like specific skills? I mean, I know we've kind of talked about like understanding the waves and understanding, did you have any specific like mental games you played or any skills like that that you, that you used or that you have taught people since then? Yeah, so um, this was something that I, learned my senior year. So my senior year of college was the year right before the Olympics. And it was also the year that we were going to win a national championship. Like we just, we just knew it. Like it was going to be our thing. And um, so that October of my senior year, I get a back injury and I'm probably out of the water for a good month, which in swimming, we don't get there's no season in swimming, right? I mean, there's a difference between your practice on Saturday, you take Sunday off and your practice on Monday morning feels awful because you've lost that feel of the water, right? Um, and, and so a month is like catastrophic in swimming. So I, I was just freaking out. And I remember working with my coach's wife and her name was Patty. And she was just such a great mentor to me but she had, I mean, she's the coach's wife, but she knew not a whole lot about swimming. <laughs> and she was kind of detached from the sport, but she could recognize kind of the mental battles that I was in right now. And what she taught me was one, to forgive myself, right? And to take that pressure off myself and just know that I'm doing what I can with what I have, and that's gonna be good enough. And whatever's gonna happen is meant to happen. And really relying on, you know, she she's not of my faith, but really relying on a higher power and kind of surrendering that to a higher power. And for me, it was my heavenly father and savior, Jesus Christ, to say, okay, I'm going to do what I can. And whatever's supposed to happen is supposed to happen. And so every day, you know, as I am going through rehab and, and trying to do as much as I can, to maintain my fitness levels at that time, I had to just focus on the moment and, and let that moment be what it was and find the joy in that moment. And even though there were times in the pool when you know, it hurt and I wasn't able to train at the level I wanted to, I forced myself to find joy in that moment. And maybe that joy was, you know, I didn't look at the clock. I, I did practices that was not measured in time. It was just measured in feel and how my body felt. And that was it. 
which in swimming is weird, right? Like everything is based on time. But I had to take that, I had to take that out of my equation or I had to just remember that I love the water and to just focus on, okay, where is the water going right now? I can hear it in my ears. I feel it in my mouth. You know, I feel it on my hands, my feet, like where are the bubbles? I mean, it was just such an amazing experience to take myself out of the future of what may or may not happen to take myself out of the past that I can't change and to say, okay, I'm just going to be right here in this moment today. And I'm going to do the best that I can. And that's going to be good enough. And tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing, but I can't think about tomorrow because I can't control it. And that taught me not only to, you know, take an injury because in athletics injuries are more mental than they are physical. Um, most of the time, but it also helped me to find joy in my sport again, that I, that I had forgotten, right? My, my six-year-old swimming self loved the water because it, I just loved the feel of it, right? I mean, to feel like you're floating in, in a space is, is so fun, but I had forgotten that along the competitive journey and, and being able to remember that and to connect with those moments again helped me find joy in what I was doing, even though it wasn't at my greatest capacity. That's amazing. So finding just the moments of joy that you can, that's, that's awesome. So once you retired at the very old age of 24, right? Isn't that when you retired from competitive swimming? Oh, yeah. You had just done everything there was to do at 24. Um, you stayed at the U of A and you worked in personal development. So why did you choose service instead of, you know, becoming a swimming coach or some of the other paths that a lot of Olympians take? What, what drew you to service? Yeah. So when I was on the national team, which was such a blessing, and I was on the national team for about five years leading up to the Olympics. And, um, I swam, you know, a couple of years after the Olympics and being at that level at you know, being at international competitions where you're seeing the best in the world, I started to recognize that there were two types of swimmers. There were, and I think across the board athletes, right? There are some athletes who need to win and they need to have that success because that's what their identity was wrapped up in, right? They were the swimmer or they were the athlete which meant they needed to be the Olympian or the medalist or the Olympic record holder, right? I mean, whatever it is, that was their worth. I was blessed that in my collegiate experience, my coach, you know, really focused on the holistic development. And he would tell me all the time, the better you develop as a person, the easier swimming fast is going to become. And I think that's in life right? The more we develop ourselves and can keep ourselves whole and, and, um, you know, filled, the better we're going to be able to perform in any arena that we find ourselves in. And so, you know, when I look at the purpose of sport, and so when I was at the Olympics, the, the pinnacle, everyone would see the you know, fist pumps and like, it's so happy and everyone's so excited and they're eating weird food and it's great. Right. But what they don't show you behind the scene is like, there's a lot of sadness and there's a lot of pressure. And again, these people who, who have done so much in their career had everything riding on, you know, three tenths of a second. And I knew at that moment that I was given a unique perspective, right? I had, I knew who I was right? From my faith, I knew that I was a child of God. I knew that my worth was, you know, not tied to records, medals, times, whatever, right? My family was going to love me. My coaches were always going to coach me that I had a great support base. And this is something that I want to do. I love doing this. And I wanted to help other athletes understand that what they do does not define them, right? They don't have to be the swimmer the track athlete, the football player, they can still be them. Now, the qualities that you have, maybe you're competitive, you're hardworking, you just have, you know, great talent, whatever it is like that helps you in your arena, but it's not who you are, 
right? And you can apply those in other areas. So as soon as I was done swimming, I knew I wanted to get back on a college campus because I felt like that time of our life is where we really formulate our identities and we're able to have that foundation being laid in college. So that's where I wanted to be. Um, and I worked at the rec center at the University of Arizona. Not that I knew how to run a pool, but <laughs> I figured it out. And I would just volunteer with the athletic department. I would do night programming with them, whether it was leadership or career stuff or you know whatever it was they needed, I was there. And even now in my current job, I do career and professional development for alumni. And it's the same thing. It's understanding that, okay, you might be a biomedical engineer. That's awesome. And what you do is amazing work, but that's not who you are, right? Your, your core in who you are and, and those qualities that make you you carry with you to whatever arena you're in. And that was like my mission was to help people understand their core and to help them transition to other arenas. And when we were in athletics, we had this accurate, this saying, which was, I am, I can, and I will. And all of our programming was structured around those three phrases, right? So it was the identity of development in I am, right? Because yeah, I am a swimmer, but I am a sister, I am a student, I am all these identities. And those are great, those are good things. And then what can you do? I can, dream big, right? Dreams are free, so you might as well go big. And then the I will statements. Okay, what can you accomplish today? What will you do with those skill sets? And, and that was really how I learned to, to help people understand their core set of skills and then how to use them and how to use those tools to build the life that they want. Um, so I, I, and I still believe that. And I, and I love doing and having those conversations and doing the work that I do. That's amazing. And I love that. And that's the, the, one of the takeaways from this I'm going to have. So say it again. So I am, I can, and I will, those yeah, are the things. I will. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for talking with us. Um, uh, our survivors group, our, our little fledgling um, survivors group is so grateful to you for speaking with us and um, giving us sort of your dose of courage. It's so contagious and it makes me just want to like, I don't know, not go swimming. It's like cold here right now, but just, <laughs> you know, it makes me want to, it makes me want to accomplish and be more. So thank you so much for meeting with us and tell your husband and your two little babies. Thank you for lending us, lending you to us for the evening. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and good luck to you and continuing to help people. We love service. And this is just a, you know, um, reminder to anyone who sees this, that um, the, as survivors, we'd love to help. We'd love to hear your story. So reach out and we can help you to spread service in remembrance of um, the loved ones that you've lost. So thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks, Lacey. Thank you. Bye-bye.